I hope to show you that you should not be complacent in your democracy, that no democracy is safe, and that everything can turn like that. Have you ever been harassed because of your work? Yes. Have you been threatened online? I oh. Have you been called biased? Yes. Have you been called stupid? Yes, plenty times. By idiots. Have you been called disrespectful? Yes. Have you been accused of corruption? Yes. Have you been called ugly as a response to any story? Yes. Have you been called fake news? Oh yeah, they always say I'm fake news. Anything that's critical is fake, right? Have you been accused of being an imperialist spy? Yes. Have you been accused of being a communist operative? Yes. Have you been accused of working for the CIA? Yes. Have you been sexually harassed as a journalist? Yes. Has your family been threatened, harassed, or alluded to? Yes, uh, it has. Uh, specifically my daughter, when she died, uh, there were a lot of people who made fun of that. Have you been threatened with rape? Yes. Yes. No, not me, but my family. Have you been threatened with violence? Yes. Have you been threatened with death? Yes. Have you been told how you're going to be killed? Yes. Has the violence been described to you? Yeah, blow my head off uh, or bury me alive. What will stop you from reporting? Nothing. 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 Death? Did you have to kill me? Okay, I know I don't come from, I don't come from uh, a position of power when I want to sob my eyes out before I start talking to you. That was such a powerful presentation, particularly that last minute. Um, there is something comforting on some level to know that this is so global and, and that we are, no matter where we are reporting from, journalists are the target. Um, but. We, just through this presentation, it's so clear that you were ringing the bell long before the term fake news was popularized by Trump. by Trump. He likes to claim it, but in fact, it goes way back to the 1800s, so he doesn't get that one. But nobody was listening. Nobody was listening. Well, as you say, we are in an election year. We are listening. So what do you think is the role of the public. This is the, these are the people being targeted, their opinions being to be swayed. So what is your best advice to, to the general public who is the recipient of all of this um, propaganda masquerading as fact? I think the first is you have to be vigilant. You know, don't be arrogant. Uh, don't be complacent. And the journalists should do their jobs because part of our problem was uh, we saw this stuff happening and I brought it to mainstream, to our TV reporters who thought that they could weather it out because it's only social media. Mm -hmm. Guys, this is like uh, the movie Inception. Remember in that movie, Leonardo DiCaprio, they went into the dream world to change the real world? Uh, the power of social media is insane. I don't think we knew it. I don't think Facebook knew it. I think they're just figuring this out. So first is democracy can <laughs> X change. It's you're doing it, you're here, uh, you're talking about it. You're, you, have to, you have to form communities that will prevent your worst selves from coming out. You will be manipulated to hate. You will be angered. Um, from the little I've seen in Canada, I mean, you're so, I love the things I've seen in the last few days, extremely um, inclusive societies. Uh, you, this could change so quickly and it will play to the worst of your nature. So be aware of that. And I, I would say, you know, it's lovely to hear that, but I don't think anyone here is under the uh, misconception that this hate doesn't also exist in Canada against uh, you know marginalized communities and and I think that's that's the the question I want to just dig in a little deeper on is you know eight months before our own election how I mean I uh, 
ban on Twitter or a Twitter strike or a Facebook strike is not the solution to this? How can people call it out? I think the first is we started trying to form these communities that would keep track of the sites that were spreading it and the Facebook accounts or Twitter accounts. And then we went to them, but that was two and a half years ago. They didn't take any action. The network that they took down three weeks ago, we reported on that in a, 13 months earlier. Imagine the damage that could have been prevented. So um, how do you do it? You push Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. You push them to actually take on the roles that, so what happened is news groups used to have, uh, we created and distributed news. Then we gave up that power. The distribution went to Facebook, YouTube, Google, uh, sorry, uh, Twitter, right? But along with distribution with us before, we were the gatekeepers. And then when it went to the social media platforms, they didn't, they refused the gatekeeping powers. And in fact, a lie, something that angers you, spreads faster than truth. And so the lie becomes truth because it spreads so much faster. So that's part of it. And, and in my case, I was thinking through, what are the solutions to this? There's short, medium, long term. The long term one is education. We need to understand this. The medium term is media literacy. We don't have time to wait for the medium term. The short term is actually to put pressure on the social media platforms. Clean it up or we will call you out. Um, and that's worked this year for us. Although we saw the, when Mark Zuckerberg was in front of the, um, the committee in Washington, clearly they didn't even know what to ask him. I know they were true. so behind the eight ball on the issues. And I think media literacy is, is the key to this, no doubt about it. But just this week in the New York Times, um, they called Twitter, I think it was the most dangerous social media platform in the world. Uh, what is your reaction to that? Depends on which country you live in. Um, WhatsApp was extremely dangerous in India, uh, where people, in, in Myanmar, it's Facebook. Ethnic violence, you had 200,000 people displaced, right? Uh, in Brazil, uh, it's WhatsApp. Uh, another journalist, Patricia, was, uh, was clobbered on WhatsApp. Uh, an Indian journalist, um, Rana Ayub, gets clobbered on Twitter. So fa this week, I think it was WhatsApp, which is owned by Facebook. Facebook, has come up with a plan, they believe. They did it in India a year ago. They're finally doing it now, um, where they are limiting the number of people. Do, do you think that's going to make a difference, though? I think that they... Mm, it's hard to tell. So it's kind of like this, right? If you think about it, about democracy as the, a human body, if you, what courses through our veins is blood with oxygen that, that gives us what we need. But imagine that that oxygen uh, is be, being pumped full of, instead of blood, it's toxic sludge because the gatekeepers aren't keeping it clean. Uh, and so the more they do, the easier it is to get a temperature on where exactly our democracy is. Because, you know, I have to say, I sat in on several panels um, in the last two days, and, you know, some of the discussions we have all stem from the information that we get. And if you're being manipulated, and if the information is inaccurate, and you're being goaded, then you will get the results. You know, it's hard to say, be nice all the time. It doesn't work. So, so for me, the more they do, the better it will be. The more they do, the greater the chances that they won't be splintered by regulation by, by legislators who know very little about what they're trying to legislate. Yeah. Speaking of goading, I'm guessing that you didn't get a congratulatory note from Duterte when you ended up time person of the year. <laughs> what was the reaction at home? Um, Somebody did ask at a press conference, and he, he said, Sa inyo na yan. Uh, he dismissed it and said, oh, they can have it, which is okay. Yeah. That's all right. The alternative we understand. But uh, do you suppose that you've become safer as a result of that honor or more vulnerable? You know, when, so I found out about 
Time Person of the Year on Twitter <laughs> when they announced it. So, and it was so funny because- Did you think it was fake news? You know, I really did. I mean, I did. Because <laughs> it was a very strange day. On that day, I had filed, I posted bail four times that day. Oh. And then in the afternoon, so the morning I was in court, in the afternoon, I was actually sitting down with our team to figure out whether I needed to get security. Because we've increased security in the office because I have young reporters. And it's hard to tell when these attacks move into the real world. But that night, we, it was 6.30, and we, I was just having dinner. And the first thing I did when I saw it was, uh, can you please check? And then when I saw Khashoggi and then uh, Capital Gazette, then, then, and then then I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm the only one who's free and alive of the four of them. Is this what our future is like? And is this what I'm looking forward to? Um, you know, and I, and I thought, well, no, uh, we have to do something about it. And I think it's a good thing because I'm holding my government responsible for my safety. Yeah, that's a very good point. <laughs> but I noticed also on your grid that the attacks on the media started, you know, again, almost a year and a half before Donald Trump stood up at a microphone and called the media the enemy of the people. However, he is still the occupant of the Oval Office. So what do you see as the impact of that globally for the president to say that and the message that it sends to other leaders like uh, Duterte or Maduro or, you know, there's a, there's a, we call them the D8 now at work, the dictators we, we cover. It's like he declared open season, right? I mean, starting the first report, that, so we felt this immediately, you can see, but the first report that verified it was Freedom House came out with a report in November of 2017. They said the cheap armies on social media was rolling back democracy in like 28 countries around the world. And then a year later, that became 48 countries around the world. When, the, when President Trump, where do I begin? My reporter, our reporter was kicked out of the Malacanang Palace a few months, 10 months before Jim Acosta of CNN was, his, before his accreditation was taken away. President, when President Trump called CNN and the New York Times fake news, a week later, Duterte called Rappler fake news. That was a week after President Trump. So without guiding principles, without a moral beacon, without pressure from outside, uh, it is open season on us. And we saw that. But strangely, Venezuela actually is making me, you know, President Trump, the United States is leading the charge, right? Yeah, he finally found a dictator he doesn't he like. Yeah, exactly. So that was an interesting week. So I, I'm really hoping, I mean, again, looking at what's happening in Venezuela, you know, hopefully it, it is, well, of course, they're also at a make or break point, right? If, if they go back to where they were, they'll, it'll get even worse. Um, and it all depends now. So they're now getting pressure from the bottom and global pressure. Now it depends on the military. Mm -hmm. And that's, these are the same elements President Duterte plays with. He doubled the, the, the salary of soldiers. He owns the police, right? So these are the same things in every. Well, we saw the same thing, the way the Taliban built, was built was because they weren't paying the military. So they, they look wherever they can. Oh. Okay. Get that. But I want to get to your personal situation with your legal troubles. You've uh, become the Al Capone of <laughs> the Philippines with all these tax evasion charges. How do you even um, ju uh, park this in your head? Where do you park it when these are trumped up charges? They're looking for anything to tear you down. How do you personally uh, manage that? It's, it's, we saw it coming. You know, and I think, so every news group is gonna, in a country like mine, uh, has to choose between good business and good journalism. Because good journalism is bad business. And the first battles we had were, you know, three years earlier, because uh, our businessmen on our board were essentially telling us, are you going to survive this? and kind of hinting that we should kind of, you know, chill. Um, of course, 
The journalists are the single largest group of shareholders in Rappler. We had 3% more votes, so we went full steam ahead, and as expected, the charges came. So it wasn't a surprise. I knew that they couldn't find any evidence of corruption because we're not corrupt. Um, we pay all of our taxes, so you know how they were able to make these charges up. They turned us from a news group, they reclassified us from a news group to a stock brokerage agency. And they said that the last investment we got from Omidyar Network, that we actually effectively sold it outside, so we should have paid taxes on that as income, not as an investment. So it's really, it's weird, but I, I guess, you know why I have hope? Because if they actually convict me on these charges, it will wreck the stock market. There, there are other companies with, with these <laughs> investments, you know? But as long as I think they just wanted to intimidate us. How does that intimidation affect you personally? I mean, you're, you're heading home in the next uh, few days. And um, when you see the plane coming down over Manila and you think, all right, I'm going to have to go to customs like what what goes through your mind mechanically the things that you could face i could sail right through or they could stop me i mean what are sort of the real things that affect you on that front you know lisa now it's actually so much easier than at the beginning because they know you well now it's a new normal and i've already posted bail <laughs> i no longer have an arrest warrant until the next one right it's it's not knowing whether they'll break into your apartment and arrest you because they don't have to tell you they have an arrest warrant right so that part was harder than than now i mean i guess um i i i laugh a, a, you know i've run out of synonyms for the word ridiculous for the ch for the charges um i also i also get a lot of energy from rappler from my team it's a young team it's you know, our median age is 23 years old. The median age of the Philippines. The future and, looks good then. That is encouraging oh, it's, to hear. I'm telling you, I am, I am optimistic. And you know why? Maybe you shouldn't tweet this yet. Mm -hmm. I think we can win this battle. You well, know? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I know that there are people who have questions, so I'm going to just ask one more before... Um, we open it up to the floor, but you know, there's this perception that most of this hate online, on Twitter, on Facebook, wherever, comes from the right. What is your opinion on that, given the real work your team has done to really identify and call out these, the, the bots or the haters or, you know, so the, call them what you will? Well, <laughs> right, I guess. In the Philippines, it, we have our, our representative. We don't, we're not set up right. Uh, we do have right and left, but the uh, attacks are insanely personal. They're not political because our political party system is very weak. Um, in the Philippines, we don't really need bots because labor is so cheap. So it's about fake accounts. And Facebook knew that because in their disclosure several years back, they have a footnote that says the Philippines has higher than average number of fake accounts. And those fake accounts pretend to be real people. So the hardest thing is um, keeping your faith in real people, you know, because the stupidity multiplies and you sit there and you go, I don't think real people are like this. And I don't think Filipinos believe it is okay to kill. But you know what's, what's so shocking was within six months of President Duterte coming to office, there are so many Filipinos who went online to say that they want to kill these drug users. It doesn't make sense. It is what they were told, it's what they were pounded, it's what they were manipulated to say. So, uh, I don't know, the jury's still out. There isn't, in terms of political um, speak here and in the United States, the breakdown, and I can tweet the new knowledge report, the breakdown definitely, you're seeing the alt-right, the far right in the US with the far right in Europe coming together with a link towards the IRA. That's why it's so interesting. So if you think about it, social media is all a power play. 
and it is connected to geopolitical power. I don't think it's a mistake that in October 2016, President Duterte, without telling the uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry, he went to Beijing and announced that the Philippines would be pivoting from the United States to China and Russia. He tagged in Russia, right? And here's the reason why. 